to press it first, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> um, but I, I think see, when I record, I record into the cloud and, and I've got a certain amount of storage space. I can also record directly to my hard drive if I wanted to. Um, but anyway, anyway, I'll, I'll throw it open for anyone who wants to, to talk about anything today or chat. Can you, can you tell us about the conference? <clears throat> uh yeah it was good i mean yeah i managed to squeeze in 11 sessions of teaching and activation in the in the few days um and there was lots of activation so each session had two or three activations in it um, and we did some physical activations with flags and engaging into the different angels and the different and into the four faces of god um that was great yeah i mean i think people benefited from it and you know that's positive feedback uh from people who uh experience a deeper relationship with the father and dealt with some of their father issues and various things as we ministered into it but uh, the intensive will be you know more going into it in a more intensive way i mean this this conference was more like other people's intensives i think you know it was we did pack a lot in and You know, gave people a lot of opportunity to engage and I did you know a couple of Q&A sessions um, but yeah it's, it, I would you know it, it people can still get it now and and see it all I mean it's it's um, you know 11 sessions uh, with a lot of activating things um, Excellent. so you are happy for your first one yeah 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 no I am I mean if, you know there was you know a few technical things you are in out and you know But generally speaking, um, everything everything worked as we thought it would. And how many people came? Um, there weren't many people who came, um, which was which was better actually because it meant that we could interact more, and they felt more comfortable to ask questions and share, you know, within the sessions. Um, but there were I don't know, 180 people I think watching online, <sighs> so um, all over the world. Um, and st people are still you know, buying this ac access to it and we will we will probably add all the audio sessions to the videos and the pdfs this week later this week um so uh, it's it's yeah yeah i would benefit most people i think for such a <laughs> level we went uh, back and did some things that we'd not done before i i mean it was a lot of stuff which i hadn't taught before The firestones, that activation, and that engagement—something <coughs> I'd not talked before. Um, you know. Just by interest, Mike, um, is are those sessions going to be part of the program for those who are um, members and pay for it, or is it going to be completely separate? And if you want it, you have to pay. You have to pay for it. Yeah, it'll be separate because we didn't think it would be fair to mm -hmm. have some people buy it and some people get it for free. Yeah, that, that wouldn't that wouldn't be very very just, I don't think. And quite a lot of people from the Engaging God program already purchased it. Oh, um, right. So to make it free to the others would be, yeah, of course, not quite fair. So it will we will probably put it as, as a paid for module within Engaging God, because um, I think it, it was you know it was quite an intensive thing. So you could go through all the aspects of fatherhood, sonship engaging god's heart in eternity engaging the assault of god for your scroll um it went into it in quite a bit of depth really uh, see that uh, yeah okay yeah Agnes, you got your hand up there yeah um i was one of the people that that bought it and watched it on stream and it was very very good okay. um especially the engagements they're really good so It brought to me, you know, many things that I probably wasn't ready about a year ago, but I felt I could, you know, it could resonate well with me now and I felt, you know, and some of the scriptures that you spoke about, the Lord had given to me about three weeks ago. So it kind of like opened it all up and I was like, yeah, oh, that's what it means. So yeah, it was quite, it was a divine appointment for me and I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, which reminds me, I think I lost my de my login details, you know, for the access of the for the main program. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I, need, I think I need to call in for that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank All right. you so much. Yep, Mary. Hi, Mike. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, honestly, I just don't know where to start, you know, because that conference was just something else. And each time I just go to the presence of God, I just find myself just praying for you. I just pray for you. I say, Lord, I just thank you for Mike. I thank you for his heart. You know, um, oh, I, I got so much from it. And it, it made me to reconnect because I, I've been doing some of these things, you know, because of the prompt of the Holy Spirit. But I didn't really, you know, I, I, because I could sense a lot and my feeling and stuff like that. Especially the Yodeh Vahe, but... I couldn't understand deeply what I was doing. <laughs> if you asked me to do something, I just do it, but I could do it. But it made so much sense to me with that conference. And I'm just so grateful, you know, for God, for what, you know, um, he's putting you as a forerunner. And uh, I'm grateful to be part of uh, Joshua Generation because that blessing comes all upon us. And uh, honestly, I cried, you know, it was so emotional for me, even last night. But I could just sense the father more, you know, with the, um, I just fall in love with the ark, you know, right from the beginning, but I couldn't understand why. But now I know it's just that presence, you know, of God and the open heaven, you know, because I think on the 19th, I just got an invitation from Jesus, you know, he was standing at the ark door and it, it with a light and he was standing there, you know, wanting me to come, you know, so everything is just, you know, are coming, you know, making sense to me. And uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for, for, for you, for what God has placed in you. And from the bottom of my heart, I'm just saying thank you to you, you know. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. You're very welcome. It was, uh, it was great privilege to be able to engage with people. And there were people there actually, who, you know, we, we advertise it as sort of an intermediate type level conference, but there were some people who actually came who, who were, probably not at the stage that um i was expecting but they still engaged they still engage learns it and i did a couple of round table sessions uh like breakfast time so people could just sit around and talk and share and uh you know, ask questions and things which was good so yeah overall i think i think it it's sometimes you know when you when you compress something into a specific period uh, i did a lot of legislating for it to open up heaven i i got legislative decrees and laws for it so you know i presented them at the beginning um and that in a sense you know is for the whole of the all the conferences that are to come and all the intensives um, so i think it was a an environment that um, we haven't done it like that before and mm. particularly like the engaging god program you know, I teach it and I pretty much stick to the script. Whereas when you're in a sort of setting like this, you can much more interact with people and respond to what their spirit is drawing out of you and engage with. Um, uh, and therefore, you know, it's, it's much easier to, to flow in, in, by having that type of environment. Whereas our local environment sometimes, um, you know, I'm, I can just, keep uh keep on the focus and do the teaching um whereas in this you sort of tend to be much more interactive which was great you know it was good okay yeah laura uh i am very happy that the uh, side effect of the conference for me is that i have a new francophone uh, contact okay. because you have a swiss a french swiss guy named claude who oh claude yeah and he contacted me via the blog, not knowing, you know, who was doing the blog or whatever. So we are in touch now. And uh, it delights me to have somebody from the francophone, you know, francophony. Uh, and I can see that God is opening doors, another door, and I'm delighted with that. So I'm coming to the intensive, as you know, and I'm really yeah. looking forward to that. Okay. That's my little side. It's I've connected with uh, somebody else uh, in the Francophonie, so I, I love that. 
Yeah, I'm Claude basically rented a house here or a, a room or something for a month and came for a month. Um, so he, he's been around on Sundays and he's come to some of our groups and I've spent some time with him um, for a month. And I think, you know, he's, he's got sort of involved because uh, sometimes you, you see more when you're you know, sort of inactively involved and you can connect in, in certain ways. So I think he, uh, he enjoyed himself. I think I think he's going back couple of days time um, to Geneva uh, so yeah so good glad it helped <laughs> okay all right okay anyway any other anything else you want to share Mary okay yeah you know regarding the the flag you know I'm interested in getting this flag because I'm a visual person so um, I'm kind of you know where can we get the flag from and the, the colors, though, yeah. Where do you get them from? Mm. Um, we we have someone who basically makes them. Um, okay. So she she's she's a she uses them in our corporate times to open portals and to change uh, okay. atmospheres and do various things like that. And so she. When we um, first started engaging the four faces of God and, and particularly these four angels of transformation, transformation, winds of change, sand of many waters and refiner's fire. Um, she made the flags um, just by revelation. So each and the colors that went with the lion, the ox, the eagle, the man, which are the four faces, she just kept, got by revelation. So she just made them. So I don't think you can and she drew the pictures on the flag. So it's not something I think you can go out there and buy. Um, can she make it for, for whoever wants it? Um, kind of person. Yeah. She possibly could. I mean, she, do, she does do craft stuff. So she does make things and sell things, I think. So possibly I can, I can yeah, certainly please. ask her yeah. um, if there was a commission for, to make some flags. I'm sure she would <laughs> potentially do so. I mean, we do use them quite a lot. And what we find is that you can, someone can sit down and they can look to engage. Mm. But when you sort of actively step into a particular place in the room or onto a flag, something activates because you're stepping mm. into it. You're, you're, mm -hmm. you're sort of activating it. You can do it without. I mean, yes. but just when you actually have those things there we i mean a lot of people there you know i didn't obviously show it on the conference thing because um yeah we we didn't have another camera fixed on it but um people got up they went and stood on the different flags they lay on the flags when we were doing the activation some of them were actually going up and lying on the particular flag um in the activation um obviously as i said for the conference you know anyone in the Joshua generation can invite those four angels to come and engage with them and to interact with them. So you can invite them into your room, into your corporate gathering. If you've got one, as long as everything, everyone's happy with that. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't invite it, go and inv tell the pastor you're inviting four angels into your <laughs> corporate meeting if they're, if they're sort of going to be quite shocked with that. But, you know, certainly in your own room, uh, I would invite them because um, they're yeah. there to help with the process of our maturing in sonship. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, having them set out as a, uh, as a physical representation works. And we left them out for our Sunday gathering and, and a lot of people who stayed over on the conference um, engaged uh, with that as well on the, on the Sunday morning. And uh, I, for us, it's, it's a, it's a helpful visual aid to engaging uh, which i think for some people just getting up and standing somewhere just activates something in them but yeah yeah but um, I, I will ask her i will ask her and i'll get back to you okay thank you right. and regarding you know the four faces as you have explained in the um the slide mm. because I, I just want to go back again especially with the yod here by a Mm. And then um, that picture that those arrow and they pointed into two, two, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, where the um, lion face, what is actually, 
doing, like the transformation, the many waters and stuff like that. Mm. Do you have a slide, you know, that I can just um, try to put all of them together so I know when I step into this, this is what I get. I'm looking forward. Yes. Um, I, I had another 50 slides to do on that session, which I didn't get to. <laughs> Not wanted to keep you there until midnight. Um, but when, when, I release the PDF, one, like, when I release the PDF, you'll get all the, all the pictures of the s flags and the different aspects to the four faces of God oh, around right. the ark in yeah. thing and where, what the interactions were. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, you'll get that information. Yeah. PDF. Thank you. That, that's what I'm asking for. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, all right. I'm blessed. <laughs> okay, Chris, you got your hand up there. Hi, Mike. Yeah. Um, I, I've been thinking a little bit about the restoration of all things, so it's a kind of small topic. Um, <laughs> but I was, I was meditating on, on your, te your testimony, you know, your first testimony when you, you engaged the fire stones mm. by the river of fire. Yeah, and then you found a, a throne with your your name upon it, yeah. and then a, an angel, if I'm right, remembering it, an angel opened the portal, and you saw creation as it was or as it should be, mm. and then yeah. you turned it around and you saw the devastation through the fall and everything. And I was just thinking, is that a special throne, or is that the throne, your main throne? Is that a kind of where the restoration, where the sons of God begin to bring restoration from that particular place? Uh, so that's kind of what I've been thinking about. Um, and is that is that on one of your mountains or is that something else? Is that the one throne to rule them all? Is that like Father's throne that you sit on his mountain? How yeah. does that work? Um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I, I personally feel that it is it's a a place for sonship to engage creation, and it's alongside the ancient of days and Jesus. For me, it's the highest realm of government where you can be seated alongside God in that restoration process. Um, and the other mountains are more to do with your personal sphere um, or any corporate sphere you're in, where this is more like being, it's like being a bench of three with father's son and you being the person who is agreeing obviously with being one spirit. If you think of whoever's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. It's like father, son and us with being one spirit are a bench of three for creation and the restoration that we were commissioned to be involved with in our original destiny scroll. So whatever we were doing before we came here, we still have that as the area of creation that we respond to something connects to us. And I think we can, you can find out more by re-engaging with what you were doing before you were here. And you'll find that you were light, you were an aspect of light and you had a role within the order of things. If you like, you know, I can go into the whole details here, but I do believe you're right. And when we did, we did, I did a session of teaching in this conference actually on the firestones. And I believe there are nine engagements that you can have with those nine stones. And there are nine levels of ascension um, that will bring you to a point where you're, we are at a place with God that there will be three more stones added. And those three stones will bring the throne that we've been seated on to another level. It will, the first stone will bring it to the level of the heaven of heavens. The next stone will bring it to the level of perfection. The next stone will bring it to the level of, of eternity. Not the created realm of eternity, not eternity itself. I mean, eternity is not a created realm. It just, it's an existence of God uh, now, if you like. Um, so, yeah, I believe there are, very key engagements for us to come to maturity, both within the character and nature of God, our governmental sonship, eternity itself. I was given my chancellor's seal there the fourth time I think I went there. I, I believe there are nine levels. I've been to seven, I think, now, having just done this engagement on the conference. Um, I, the first one was 2008. 
which I didn't really understand, <laughs> really, until I went back there and then it, everything started to make sense. 2012, 2013, 14, 15, 16, and I had this encounter last week. Um, and each one of them were different. Some of them were almost like you went into the stone and it absorbed you into and took you into something. Some of them you stood on it and you felt like you were part of it, but it was emotional and touching your sort of being. Um, very powerful encounters. Um, and I, I do believe that they are the revelation encoded in light that is our destiny in relation to creation um, and its restoration. Um, so, yeah, they're really, yeah, quite, in, I find the experiences really intense. Yeah. I think I'm getting used to it a little bit, but you know, the first one, the encounter was just totally intense. I get the impression then there's going to be a larger role rather than just visiting, you know, these, this place. Yeah. If, if all those thrones are to be occupied by God's sons and daughters for us to bring in the restoration of all things, I get the impression then there will be, there's a larger role uh, we're waiting for where, where we will occupy it in a more profound way, where we, where we will start to see mm. the restoration yeah, I, I feel that we are maturing to a place where we're involved with God in the administrative, governmental, co-creating roles. So uh, as, as these three stones, is like we, know there's, we know there was nine stones, nine fire stones represented by the nine stones that covered Lucifer's body or the covering cherub whoever we want to call him, you know, that covering chair had nine stones. We know the high priest, bless pray, had 12. And we know the 12 foundation stones to the New Jerusalem. And there are 12 stones decorating the walls of the New Jerusalem. So that there, God has included man in his fullness of government. And although God is complete in himself, Father, Son, and Spirit, He's called us into the circle of that relationship governmentally as well as just relationally. So I do believe that we have a role to play in seeing those three stones of our maturity, if you like, added to the nine of the fullness of God to bring the fullness of God's government. And I think you go for, obviously we know that Zechariah 3, 7 talks about you know, walking in his ways here so we can be a friend of God, then being in lordship, outworking his laws, having in governance of the house, charge of the courts, and then free access among those who are standing in those higher level courts. And I think we know God is calling people into roles as and commissioning them into roles as you know, oracles and legislators and scribes but also things like magistrates and judges and a whole host of other roles. Yeah. And I think some of those other roles are what reconnect us to what we were connected to before. Um, and I, I believe that those three extra stones may well be some of the things that take us into the ages to come um, and not necessarily all in this age perhaps um, and i believe ultimately going from lords kings sons there was then the co-heirs ship because we know we're co-heirs with christ but i think there's a level when you engage this that is in as you say you're seated in that position of co-heirship for creation and you're beginning to respond in a much more governmental sense of sons and I believe there's a co-creatorship. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> um, and then eventually being ascended fathers um, when we've completed our maturity process. And if we're going to co-create, then we will have a different role towards that stuff we're co-creating. So, yeah, a lot of interesting things, really, with the firestones and our sonship and our maturity and those nine ascension levels, you know, Adam was born uh, and God breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living being, a living soul. Um, 
and he was not perfected he was sinless but he was going to get he was going through the process of perfecting his relationship with god and his identity as a son as a mature son and not just a baby son um, so i think there are a whole host of maturity steps that we are called to go through in relation to the father in sonship you know that's why fatherhood sonship is such a key aspect you know the whole thing of sons arise is that god wants us to arise and take these places where we are seated in the heavenly realms um, and are maturing in our sonship in the roles that we have been given there you know and there are lots of other roles creative roles um, as well as governmental roles um, yeah. So, yeah okay all right okay agnes yeah you got your hand up there again yeah um for everything that mary has ordered could i have the same as well because i did feel the same and i was wondering whether i could kind of like design them myself but if somebody can make them then could i is it possible Oops. i don't i don't know sorry i mean all i can do is ask the lady yes see if she would be willing to make them and and sell them i mean obviously it takes quite a long time um but obviously she's got the original designs so if you wanted the four faces of god um, that will be four flags like that. And again, depends whether you want the flag poles, you know, the, the things or just the actual flags themselves. Um, I'll, I'll ask her and see what she thinks. I mean, I, it's not her full time job making flags. She, she works in a school. So, <laughs> so whether she's got the time to can be commissioned to make a whole load of others, but possibly. Yeah. And if others are interested, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I'll, I'll put it out there and see, see who yeah. else is interested. I think yeah. a little business for her, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, it's not uh, only us, you see, once that open up, everybody yeah. will want to. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll see. You know, I'll, I, all I can do is ask. Yeah. Uh, but I, what we could do is obviously give you some pictures of the flags uh, so that you can see the designs. Um, then if you did want to make them yourselves or get someone else to make them who's any, who's any good at it, um, then you can at least see what they're like. They're generally, she creatively engages God to find out what colors um, to use on the flags and what images to use. We've got four flags, one for Lion, Ox, Eagle, Man. We've got another flag which contains all the four faces as in stepping into the name of God and the four faces of God. And then we've got a flag for each of the angels, the transformation and their particular colors. Um, but she's obviously got the material from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's all a bit beyond me, but. I'll stick with her. I'll stick with her. Because then, yeah. Then the other thing also is, um, I, I talked to you about this homeless um, bench that the Lord is, is setting up within the church and um i've been i've been quite frank about where i come from i have not missed my words i have you know and i think sometimes i've given them too much and i've bombarded them with you know with all them you know and i felt oh maybe that was a bit too much so yes what what, what how would you advise me like how would I go about this? Because definitely I am telling them that there is a whole new way of doing things. I've, I've been very clear about that. And I've just been kind of like giving them snippets and saying like, you know, every time we have to go and do something, we need to ask God first. I've talked to them, to them about the blueprint and mm -hmm. they have an understanding of that. But how do you think I should approach it without because I have so much confidence in what it is. I then go, boof, you know, like give it all. Hmm. How, how should I approach it? Like, uh, so, 
part of the, see a bench of three is just not just just not a name it really has to function you know so if they're not able to engage in heaven then they're not going to be able to function properly because you have to be seated in heavenly places to establish things in heaven now if you can do that but if they can't then there's going to be an inequality within the bench and therefore there isn't going to be a unity of heart in it so again you know you've just got to ask for whatever whatever god's asking you to do or whatever mandate he's given you in it you know it may take some time to get those people to a place where they are able to engage as a heavenly bench rather than just people who are calling it a bench and then asking god to do stuff you know because it's a big difference the old is well we ask god to do things for us and the new we go and we get a mandate and we do it in in heaven um so i would just continue to to you know ask where they are with it all um obviously things transition so you know is i doubt whether god would say well don't do anything until everything's perfect so so long as you, everyone's moving forward on the journey then you can move forward with it uh, and see things transition and evolve um you know but you've got to you've got to have peace in your own heart about it and and be sensing clearly what it is that god is doing in that and as it's a church ministry, you can't just do whatever you want. You know, you, you're, you're, it is within the framework of the church that you're doing it within. Obviously, both legally, if, if they've set up some sort of legal thing to do it, but also spiritually as well. You know, so I don't think you can make demands, you know, <laughs> um, but it depends really on, you know, as I said before, and we've talked about this, if you feel this is the mandate that God has given you and this is not a church mandate, then you've got to look to how you're going to fulfill that. If you think it's a church mandate, then you're going to have to go along with how the church does it you know, to a degree, but with looking to how you can help them do it in a more new way. Um, but you don't, you know, if you start getting frustrated, then you really got to make sure that you're, you know, your heart's right in it and you're not going to um, get frustrated because they don't know what you're talking about or things. And I guess you can do what you can do on their behalf until they can do it. But it's not ideal if there's not a, a unity of heart and purpose in it. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I'm kind of like trying to, um, without denying the truth of the fact that everything is changing. Hmm. And... I know that the Lord is present in this church, so I definitely honor that. But what I'd like is to, to try and um, gradually, even if it's just a little bit, begin to say, oh, oh, no, you see that there is something different. Because what I don't want is to deny the mandate, it's, it's, you know, the, the, the benefits of it being administered from heaven. It will mm -hmm. be like richer in impact and everything. I don't want to deny that and kind of like settle for the, you know, settle for the status quo. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to slowly by slowly, you know, give a little bit, you know, a little bit. And then I, re I remembered that I was actually on the training, you know, the training that she did for the leaders that were going to be working with the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I thought, oh, I'm really accountable. I cannot sit back on it because I have been trained, so... It's about being mindful about that, but also being tru truthful, you know. To, yeah, to I mean, if, if so long as there's no opposition that really you sense they're restricting or trying to restrict or trying to oppose that whole aspect, then you just got to go with the flow of it and just keep seeking God all along the way. Mm -hmm. And you do the heavenly stuff that you can do. Yeah. Uh, it's better that one person's doing heavenly stuff than no one's doing it. It would be great yeah. if three people were doing it, but one's better than none. Um, yeah. You know, but you've got to just keep reviewing it and ensuring that things behind that aren't you know, hindering it or obstructing it. And 
just continually be open to encourage people. And the best thing is when you do get together to, to plan, then yeah. you've just got to say, well, let's, let's engage God. But the way yes. I'm going to engage God is I'm, we're going to go to the throne of grace. Yes. Yes. You know? And therefore, yes. where's the throne of grace? Well, we know it's in the realm of heaven. So that's yeah. where you begin to, to demonstrate something different. Yeah, that's what I felt. I, I needed to be honest, you know, to all the efforts that you've put in me. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I felt exactly like you say to me. So thank you. All right, no yeah. problem. Okay. Uh, okay, who, who had their hand up next? I think it Lure, I think. <laughs> Because Chris disappeared for a minute into the ether. <laughs> um, two things. First of all, Mike, I would be also very interested to have the design of the flags. I can make flags myself. Okay. Uh, but if that person is happy to share, I would love to have the design, please. Okay. And right. I know other people would be interested because that's something we've been talking about with different people. So if it can be posted somewhere whatever she can help with yeah, I think a lot of people would be interested. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll check it out with her. <laughs> Thank you. And the second thing is for Agnes. Um, I feel um, I should share with you, Agnes, um, what God has been doing. I am not on a bench of three yet, but um, my heart is for France and the francophonie, obviously. And two years ago, an American uh, lady joined me because she has a heart for France and she's far more mature than I am, and Mike knows her. Um, and in two years, we still do not have a third person. But last month, God asked us to release a sound for that person. And what I have learned is that God used, first of all, relationship. So he puts you in touch with people, and you build a relationship. And in fact, during those two years, we've done quite a lot, but just get zooming together and seeing what God wanted us to do on that day. It doesn't mean that every time we engage, but we could feel it, uh, and especially she could feel it. So we have done lots of little mandates. We have done quite a lot of stuff, but we still are not on a bench. But that time we have built up a relationship, and that is priceless. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm realizing that with my old church where God is taking me back, it's the same thing. People have seen how I have changed in a few years and they come to me and they're asking me, what am I doing to look so good, to be so at peace, to be so calm and to have so many fruits in my life? And I start to share according to what God is saying to me. And I'm building up relationship which already existed with people who are hungry um, and I share what God tells me. And I've learned that patience is, is very important. And it's not jumping on a bench, which is important. It's just building up relationship the way God you know, wants us to do. Because he wants the best. So he wants us to be prepared. And to be prepared, you have to have a relationship with people. Trust them. Know who they are, what they like, what they don't like, how they respond or react. And for me, this has been an amazing lesson these last two years um, and it's getting stronger and stronger. It's not because I'm not on a bench of three. I'm not bearing fruit. I bear a lot of fruit in fact, but I'm not yet on a bench of three. So I just say, you know, if you're patient and if you ask God one step at a time, I have a sense that what he wants first is that you build up relationship. And then by modeling what you believe, People will be hungry for that. They want what you have. They will see it in you. And they will say, I want the same. So that's what's happening to me. Um, just to share. And if you want to contact me and we can talk about it more, I'm very, I will be very happy to do that, Agnes. Awesome. Yeah. Because I think that the danger is we, we look at Bench of Three as a, becomes a formula. And the reality is, I am a bench of three for my own life. If, if my body, soul, and spirit is in oneness and I am whole, then I function on my own mountain as that representation of heaven's government because I'm made in his image. So for my own mountains, there's, you, you don't have a personal bench of three. You are it. And if you are, the more whole you are, of course, and the more integrated and the more one, that you are with yourself and with God, then obviously your authority level increases personally. And we've, you, you just got to discern, 
you know, what is personal, what is the personal mandates, mountains, scroll that we have, and where we are involved with others. Because just because you're involved in a ministry with other people doesn't necessarily mean it, that there needs to be a bench of three straight away because of you do your thing under the, the, the authority that you have. And ultimately, you know, a bench to me, yes, the relational aspect and the patience of building that relationship is really, really important. Um, but I wouldn't get into the fear of, oh, if we don't have a bench, it won't work. You, you still have your own personal authority to bless everything you're involved in. And things take time. You know, as I say, you know, a few years, you know, you look at a thing a few years, oh, three years, I don't want to be spending years and years. Well, the reality is, you know, everything takes time. And we're in this not for a short haul, short term thing, but a long haul thing. And sometimes if it took 10 years to develop something, by the time you got to the 10 years, you'll be ready. And it will be ready. And the patience involved in that is all part of the process of maturing and growing through it. Um, and I think that's where knowing what is personal and what is corporate is important because you can have a personal mandate and be involved with other people and you don't need to be involved with the bench of three necessarily. You have to be called to be part of a bench and that bench has to be part of a blueprint. So it's better to wait for the clarity of the blueprint and to know that you're called. Um, otherwise, you know, people set up benches all over to do things and they're not real benches at all. They're just a name of a group of people who are saying they've got authority. And it's a huge difference between a name and the a reality of a, the relationships within three people who are working together when they're called by God into that role. And for people who, you know, the people here that I'm working with, you know, when they knew that they were called by God, they clearly felt that they weren't equipped, didn't think they were ready. And so we had to go through a process of readying and getting ready, both relationally between us and for them in their own lives. You know? um, and I think that is, uh, it's important to sort of realize that as soon as you try and formularize everything, you know, God will disrupt it because we've got to do it relationally and know clearly what we're called to do when we're called to do it and with who we're called to do it. And, you know, I'm involved relationally with lots of people, but then I'm not a part of the bench of three of those people. You know, I, I'm in relationship with them, but it's not my responsibility to be part of anything that they're doing necessarily. If I was, then I can be part of a bench with people all over the world. If, if, if that's what God is calling me to do, um, but he isn't, you know, so not at this point in time, anyway. Anyway, back to you, Chris. You got your hand up again there. Thanks, Mike. I apologize for that. I don't know what happened. My internet just cut out for two minutes, uh, but now I, I rebooted it and I'm back on. So I, don't, I was just really enjoying what you were talking about. <laughs> I think we got as far as the extra three stones um, and the, yeah. how they relate to three realms of heaven. Um, and so I was just, yeah, that's where I was really. You may have said a lot more. I don't know. Which I've well, I said a little bit, but not not too much. You can you can always listen to it again. I I think it is just a sense of our maturing to the place where we're involved in much more of the administrative things that are going on in heaven, not just doing a court case here and there or getting some legislation, but involved in the decision making thing, because we've been invested with the responsibility for creation. God made creation for us. Yes. You could say, well, it was all made by him, for him, through him. Yes, Jesus, but Jesus was a son and we're, we're co-heirs. So it's coming to that level where we actually see ourselves as co-heirs, which I think most people don't. We all know the term and we might use the term, well, I'm a co-heir with Christ, but I think that's a level of responsibility that very few of anyone's in. Uh, I think we are being prepared for it. And I think we are learning 
um, in a sense, wow, the restoration of all things, what it all means in terms of the height and depth and breadth and wow, it's way more than we ever thought. Uh, so that we can then see this is the co-heirship of that and what that means. Um, and obviously some of that is to do with the revealing of the sons of God so that creation can be set free from its bondage into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So we do need to know our glory and it's not God's glory and it isn't even a reflection of God's glory. It's the glory that he has clothed us with as his sons. And therefore, the radiating that Jesus did or the transfiguration that he resolved to see, the shining, I think when you, some of what I'm, I've always thought was referring to the throne of God, I now see was referring to our thrones. And the description of, let's say, the four living creatures in Ezekiel, for instance, Ezekiel 1, Actually, I see that that was actually is a description of us. They had human form with all these things attached, you know, and I think that's different from the four living creatures who didn't have human form. They had one face each, whereas the four creatures in Ezekiel had four faces each in human form. So I think there's a sense there that that really was a very obviously symbolic and very descriptive view of what sonship is Um, and i think that then when i'm then looking at revelation one and you know john looking and seeing what he said was like the son of man i don't think it was referring to jesus i think it was referring to us like jesus as a son who has been predestined to be conformed to the image of sonship. And it's that image which I think takes on a different governmental role and a different role in the co-heirship of all this, equipping us ultimately to be co-creators and to go on and see the expansion of whatever God has in the ages to come. And I think we will be even more involved there. So I've looked at these things and thought, yeah, what I used to think was this all related to God. And it's all God's, his throne, and this is all represented at his throne, the wheels within wheels and all that. Then when I started to look at the circle of the deep and realize the, the alignment of the chancel's houses and all those things, it was like, ah, this is, this is actually not just God's throne. It's actually in looking at more of our sonship. Uh, and what that authority is of our sonship when we are enthroned in these places. So, yeah, that uh, that's quite interesting, I think, in terms of where we're going with all this. Um, and the more I realize, you know, the more I experience God face to face and behold him, the more when I look at the Bible, all the things I thought were referring to something i find most of them were referring to something else (laughs) because because i've now had the face-to-face revelation the light to be able to look at that and see the truth within it which was at a different level and i think of course there are multiple levels manifoldness within truth that we can see this level of truth when we're at this level of maturity and then when we mature we see a different level of truth contained within the same thing Um, i know the hebrews have this whole thing of you know the different levels of truth and sort of you know ends up with a lot of different levels um, or different facets of truth within a level you know i think they were talking about four levels of truth you know the the obvious and then sort of something a little bit more hidden and then mysteries within the truth and i don't think you can find the mysteries until you begin to pursue that and discover that um, you know, because this whole thing with God hiding things, um, you know, the glory of God to, to hide something and the glory of a king to search it out. And that's a sort of a level of authority that will take us deeper. You know, and I think ultimately sonship will really begin to take us even deeper. Yeah. And that is obviously not just for the next life, as it were. That, no. That, Increasingly, I, I guess God is going to be engaging more of us as we come into maturity in that process. Yeah. With that 
in that place of authority? Yeah, um, I think so. I think, I think yeah. so. I think we mature because I can see that process in my own life and I can see it, you know, in Zechariah three, you know, sort of so many people are not yet walking in friendship with, with God, mm. you know, they're still walking as a steward, faithful, good steward of the things of God. And they're doing their ministries and they're fulfilling their stewardship as well as they can at that level of maturity. But Jesus said, well, I don't want to call you slaves or servants. You're my friends. And I'm going to reveal things to my friends that I'm not going to reveal to stewards. So our mindsets have to change so that we don't see ourselves in those old ways of thinking about ourselves, but are willing to embrace uh, a new revelation. And as we behold in the face of God, his glory, we see reflected back the image that he's created us in and we become that like that which we've beheld. I don't, without a face-to-face -face relationship with, with the Father, there's none of this stuff really is possible. We can't, this isn't an automatic thing, it's a relational thing, therefore we have to relate to the Father to be able to have the revelation of our sonship seen in the face of the Father reflected back. And I think that is way more um, but it isn't, oh, well, it'll all happen by and by when Jesus comes and sorts it all out for us. This must be maturing now. Um, and in the maturing now, we get different roles uh, of responsibility as we mature. Lords, kings, sons, chancellors, magistrates, judges. You know, there are different roles, but there's also different levels. You know, I could not do the role that I'm doing now when I was operating in Lordship. I, I didn't have the authority. I didn't have the access to places. When I was then given the, the orb and invested in kingship, then these roles began to open up. And my experience of God himself began to deepen and deepen and deepen um, because I began to pursue him more and more and more. And you know, the processes along the way the deconstruction of my mind, you know, separating soul and spirit, reintegrating. They were all key milestones that then were springboards to maturing growth. And the Firestone encounters were very much like that. You know, they were very key experiences that, that were um, really, sh a real shift took place. And it took me a, a year or so each time. The last stone took me you know, more than a year to outwork that shift because it was a radically changing mindset and engagement you know, through that process. You know, and, it, and it's not something you can rush. You, know, you can't rush maturity. You know, you've, you've got to grow. You know, wisdom, insight, revelation, they all grow. You know, you can't rush it. You can't sort of, well, I'm going to get it by a download. You know, um, yes, it does come by a download, but through the relational process of that download, not an instant download. It's not like the Matrix, you know. I know Kung Fu because I've had this download of Kung Fu into my brain. I think, yes, there are some books in heaven that you can read that give you some abilities to do things I haven't read them, but I don't think this is that like that it must be relational because god is always going to do these things relationally not through some formulaic way separate from him so my experience in going into all these things has been a journey of deepening relationship and then that unveiling and revealing more of who i am as a son of god so i can outwork that and it has changed me it's changed my personality it's changed my sense of peace you know how i feel you know you know this phrase of like now i know that i can live be living loved and i live loved then i love living so life has taken on a different perspective and then i can live loving so now i want to live that life in a more loving way because i've experienced love and i live in love you know whereas love before that was encounters that made me feel loved while I had the encounter, but it wasn't ongoing. And the 
deepening relationship with God means I can live loved. You know, I live knowing that I'm absolutely loved, completely irrespective of anything else, which means I know that God loves me whether I do anything or not. It's not performance based, orientated or in any way determined by whether I'm good enough, whether I've done a good job, whether I've earned that. I can't, no one can. God loves, you know, as much as he's ever going to love. But my experiences of his love have changed the closer I've got to him. You know, he's never loved me any more. Um, but I experience being loved more because I'm able to experience it. And that's what's happened. It's like I have a greater capacity to be loved. Yeah, and I remember in December, we did this uh, day with Justin Abraham and we, we did this sort of cat sort of thing. And in the evening, there was this sort of activation thing. And I'm, I lay on the floor. And it was, it was hard, <laughs> hard school hall floor. And I'm lying on the floor and uh, God says, I want to do open heart surgery on you. So I was like, oh, okay, go ahead. And he literally took my heart out and he showed me the capacity I had was restricted by the valves of my heart. Now he's using a physical heart as a symbol of my life. And he gave me some heart valve replacements to allow for greater capacity to come in and greater capacity to go out. Because if you have a greater capacity to come in, then there's no increase to go out, then you're just going to increase and increase until it pops. So there's got to be, and so he showed me, you know, the increases in capacity that I had in my life, and he sort of was increasing them more. So there was a, a real um, process that, of maturing and deepening relationship, which I think brings us into those places. And then you see things differently. You know, I, I've, I've known about the restoration of all things for years, but I had a concept of what it might be like, which was totally limiting to what it actually is um, because that's all I could see. But then I get my, in, my engaging God completely shaped, changes my whole perception of who he is and then all of a sudden hear the dimension of love that who he is and the dimension of his consuming fire and the light that he is all of a sudden just totally changes the view of that whole concept because i i realize how loving he is and how desiring he is to restore everything back to his original intention and purpose which changed everything when i then looked at all this, the subjects we've looked at before in terms of people and what is going to be restored and the fullness of that restoration and all that means. You know, and I'm sure that I still only grasp uh, some of that and I'm sure there's going to be more and more the deeper I engage God with. You know, and I'll share my journey along the way of that Um you know, and the more I live it, the more that becomes a, an expression of, I think, where I will be seated in that governmental roles. You know, and I've been told, you know, the next two years are really important for me um, in the in two years, there's a shift going to take place. Um, so I'm doing everything I can in these two years to be ready for whatever that shift is. You know, and I don't know what it is, but God's told me it's coming. So I'm, I'm open to whatever it takes to get me ready for that shift. And I do think some of it is recognizing, you know, more and more with along with the, the, who God really is, his precepts and his character and his nature and the very essence of love ha is changing how I see everything. And that brings a different view because you know going back to that very first encounter in 2008 when i went onto the river of fire and the fire stones as i sat on that throne and i saw things from that perspective you know that really as you as you related it to the, the restoration of all things you know for me at that point in time it was just like oh wow you know life looks a lot different from here I didn't really get the full picture of it, you know, and what I was seeing was my little bit. You know, what I saw was where I live, 
at our church and I wasn't seeing the worldwide cosmos wide universe wide perception and all the dimensions that existed I mean I'd even no idea that other dimensions existed other than heaven and earth so now I you know I see so much more you know since 2008 which I know is best 10 years ago you know when I think you know how long 10 years is a long time really isn't it you know in one sense um so that 10 years has been a huge uh, process of change transformation so now when i think of sitting there and seeing the difference between the heavenly perspective and the earthly one i don't i'm not limited by my small vision that i was then you know and that was enough to stretch my mind you know, pretty, pretty much those encounters were very changing, ch challenging and life changing, you know, but that process of expanding my consciousness over the last 10 years, I can see so much more, you know, and I can engage with so much more and realize my part to play in so much more than I would have even imagined or thought then, you know, and all the way along the line, whenever God has wanted to shift something or move me, he's had to stretch me. You know, when you're stretched, you can't go back to your original shape, you know, um, as much as you'd want to, you know, sometimes you had to twist my arm a little bit until I realized that it was pointless arguing through my own understanding, you know, I got a lot of, I got a lot of that, Mike. Um, I've just been reading, I think which relates to this, um, something from Ian Clayton, one of his, his second book, where he was talking about where we originated mm. uh, as, as light beings. As, and he talked about, if I got him right, um, I, I, want, I need to go back over it, but he's talking about coming with a scroll of destiny, mm. but also a scroll of testimony. And yeah. there's a difference. So yeah. What is the difference between the two? Well, the two scrolls that, I have engaged with the scroll of destiny is the scroll that was written for me by God. For me, the scroll of testimony or the scroll of my life is what I've called it is what do they match up is how I've actually outworked my destiny scroll. And do I have a testimony of it, it agreeing? And I've been to the judgment seat to take my roll back there to get all the wood hay and stubble which wasn't in uh in alignment with my scroll of destiny or the motive that i did things wasn't in alignment so it needed some refining and purification uh, which i went have been through um, so I, I would see that you know although i didn't call it the scroll of testimony that's what it is i called it the scroll of my life and it was a scroll of my life that i took to the judgment seat so that it, would, it was weighed against the scroll of destiny. Are these aligned? Well, of course they should be, whereas the reality is they're not. And certainly for me, it wasn't the fact of so much of what I was doing, but the motive that I was doing it with. And that was why I had to deal with the dark cloud experience of dealing with my heart and dealing with my soul's uh, position within that and motivation uh, which freed me and unveiled for God to unveil so much more. Um, yeah. But there is this light being thing, you know, um, yeah. uh, which I have reconnected to, had my mind essentially sort of remapped with my spiritual mind and had reconnection to the memories um, that I of my spiritual existence, if you like. Um, and that again is as reconnected me for the desire for restoration, because I connected what it was like before it wasn't like this, you know? And so it was just like, ah, ah, I want, I want it back. I want, I want back what my spirit knows. You know, I want, I want us to come back into what the connection with what it was like in the heart of God, and so engaging eternity in the heart of God is part of that process, but also gauging the soul of God and where we were commissioned into this role um, is also part of that. So you can bring those two things together and you become um, motivated. I, I would say for me, it was like it motivates me to see creation 
restored, for, you know, for get released from bondage, uh, set free, um, because I have a memory of what it was like before it was in bondage. And it was like, I want it back. You know, I want that restored. And then to go on to God's intention of what it would have been had it not had this sort of sidetrack for the last, I don't know how many thousands of years, <laughs> mm. um, to get it back into it. And God is at work all the time course correcting everyone to ensure that the possibility for everyone to come into that is there and so everyone's lives are being course corrected all the time in the now of god uh, to ensure good comes out of everything and we can have that even those things woven into the story of god's original purpose you know and they are redeemed you know that's what redemption really does it buys it back from its lost position and so all that happened in my life, God is redeeming it. And that redemptive part is to weave it into the story that will eventually be, this is the history of mankind. And hey, look at Chris. He, he was involved in this and this was part of the journey. And look at Mike and look at Mary and look at Ron and, look at, you know, all of us, Agnes. It's just like it was, we're woven into this story. And even our mistakes are redeemable and good can come out of all of them if we respond, you know. And I see that as just, again, the amazing sense of the love of God he has for us that would do that. He has not written us off because we're not perfect. He's w even woven our imperfection into the story to bring us into perfection, and I, I think that's just amazing. You know, I remember listening to Baxter Kruger, I think it was, who was talking about this sort of type of process. Um, and he was talking about um, J.B. Phillips, who was the guy who did the J.B. Phillips New Testament version. And J.B. Phillips was a, um, what, what's the word? Obsessive, cons obsessive compulsive disorder. And his whole life was like that. And I think sort of people with sort of slightly autistic or on an autistic spectrum or whatever. And so it was rather than, okay, well, he's not much use for us. It was like, well, let's focus his obsession on the Bible and the Greek New Testament. And let's use that obsession to write a whole version that will be more reflective of our heart. And I think, wow, yes, yeah, just amazing, you know, that God would use someone's, what we would see as a huge weakness, but God sees, well, I'm going to take that weakness. I'm going to turn it into a strength and let's, let's get him cooperating in this to bring something really amazing out of it, which is, I think, you know, pretty awesome, really. Thanks, okay. Mike. All right, Agnes, you got your hand up there. Last question. I've got to go. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you know, in one of the engagements, um, when we engage with the with the cloud of witnesses, I engaged with Daniel and um, Joseph, and you know the group that were there. And I'm having a problem with my prophetic dreams because I used to have lots of prophetic dreams, okay. and they said they were going to help me because the Lord, the father said he was going to restore my, my dreams, my prophetic dreams. And they said they were going to help me in that. So what I did, what I just wanted to understand, is it going to involve a court case or do I just have to keep going and engaging with them? I have no idea. I mean, what I would, what I would, advise you is don't assume that you think you know what that means because god may help you by removing your ability to have prophetic dreams and actually telling you directly what he wants you to know because if you keep having prophetic dreams then you're gonna have to keep trying to find the interpretation of the dreams and i believe god really wants to bring us to a place where we're able to converse and have direct revelation. So, and I'm not saying that might not be the case in this situation, but I would just don't presume anything. You know, yeah. I, if you're unsure, it's like, well, okay, well ask, ask God, ask them, 
Mm. What, what are you going to be doing? You know, are you, mm. is this that you are going to give me more clear dreams and I'm just going to know what it's about? Mm. Or are you going to do something which is going to totally transform this whole area of revelation mm. so that now I will be able to discern in a, in a more clear way? Mm. Um, and I think for me, I've learned that when I have encounters and when God says something, I most of the time don't really understand everything he's trying to say off the bat um and because my mind is limited to what i already know and he wants to take and expand my mind my consciousness beyond what i know so mm. if he says something i can't assume that i presently understand everything he means by it yeah. so then i pursue him in relationship and ask him for more wisdom more insight is this a process do i need to mature is there anything you need to do in me in this process and so I just start cooperating, really, in, in the process, rather than just trying to think I know what that means um, mm -hmm. and just be open to it going beyond that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I went to a conference uh, about three weeks ago, and I experienced the love of God. And I can you know, testify to what you're saying. It's amazing because... The one thing that really stood out for me is if you've got the love of God, then everything is all right. I mean, you don't have to worry about anything. Everything is all right. With the way you approach people, with the way you conduct yourself, with the way you approach your mandate, if you have love, then everything is all right. So, yeah, so I've been pursuing him for that as well. Great. Okay, I better leave it there. Um, 